Welcome everybody to the Ford and Energy Forum and to the launch of season two of the Propelling Women in Power podcast. Thank you very much for joining in person in the room and for those of you online. My name is Allison Bender and I'm the Outreach Coordinator here at the Wisconsin Energy Institute. If this is your first time joining us at an event, welcome. The Wisconsin Energy Institute's mission is to provide leadership on campus for multidisciplinary research, education, and outreach efforts that accelerate the world's transition to clean energy systems and solutions. Women are, obviously, integral members of our energy science community and play an enormous role in developing an inclusive, equitable, and sustainable future. Hosted by Wisconsin Energy Institute, uh, Energy Institute Communications Specialist Michelle Chung and undergraduate communications intern Mary Riker, Propelling Women in Power is a podcast about the careers of women in energy at the Wisconsin Energy Institute and our sister institution, the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center. The episodes highlight the individual experiences, mentors, and work-life balances of the guests while seeking advice for young women in science and asking the question, who and what facilitated your success? Today, we're super lucky because four incredible guests from season two of the podcast are with us to share their stories, or I guess three for now, maybe one more will be joining us. Um, And and they're here to answer your questions about the choices they've made along the way. Before we get into today's session, I want to acknowledge the land that the Wisconsin Energy Institute occupies. Um, The Energy Institute, as well as all of UW-Madison, occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called De Jope since time immemorial. Um, And we want to acknowledge that when we're thinking about transitioning away from fossil fuels, uh, the Ho-Chunk Nation and the 11 other First Nations all across Wisconsin and Indigenous nations worldwide are doing some of the most important and leading work in transitioning away from fossil fuels towards clean and just energy systems and solutions. A few logistical notes. Um, We'll have opening remarks from our panelists and some kickoff Q&As, but for those of you online, feel free to drop your questions into the Q&A box as soon as they come to you and we'll get to those. We'll be alternating in between in-person and online audience questions when we get to that point. Um, We are in the process of upgrading our audio system in the room, so for those tuning in online, thank you in advance for your patience with our currently imperfect audio. And finally, if you need live captioning, you can toggle that feature on by clicking the show captions button on Zoom. If you have any other technical questions, just let us know in the chat. So to introduce today's co-moderators, I'm super happy to introduce Michelle and Meg, the podcast's co-hosts. Michelle has been with the Wisconsin Energy Institute since 2019 when she joined the communications team as a student intern. She has since graduated and joined WEI full-time, continuing to spread the word about the amazing people, research, and events here at WEI. Meg has been a student intern since 2021. She's a senior undergraduate student in civil and environmental engineering and has worked in research, government, and industry positions over the last four years. Thank you both for all that you do and take it away. All right, thank you, Allison. Um, So um, before we get into introducing our panelists, I just wanna give like a a brief introduction and summary to how the podcast came to be. Um, So first I wanna start off with Meg and kind of ask you how we came up with this idea and um, we'll talk a little bit more about how the podcast has evolved and the upcoming season that will be released tomorrow. Thank you, Michelle. Um, So I really wanted to do this because I wanted more perspective on how women in academia chose their paths uh, two years ago before I had a bunch of experiences of my own. Um, I was curious about what we did before, and I really wanted to learn more and learn that by speaking to others, especially women. Uh, Yeah, so I was in a a similar position as Meg when she asked me about this whole like podcast idea if I wanted to join it and like really take this idea and turn it into something that it is now. Um, And since then, it's really become so much more than just like two two people wanting advice. Um, There's in these podcasts, there's a lot of great advice about uh, just generally mentoring and mentee relationships 
um, finding community with others and also just learning about the amazing research that goes on here and the, and the work that goes on here. Um, and in this new season, we've talked to a lot of new people, all of the panelists that you see here and um, someone that works in community engagement, sustainable buildings. So that's all coming up in the episodes that will be released in the coming weeks. Um, but first, I would like to introduce our panelists this evening who are, will all be guests in upcoming episodes that we'll be releasing. Um, so to directly to my right is Whitney Liu, Assistant Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering. And then we have Aurora Munguia Lopez, a postdoc researcher in the Scalable Systems Lab at UW Madison. And then Anne Sophie Borger, training coordinator at the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center. And Becky Larson, professor at the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies. Um, so I'm just going to start it off by asking all of our panelists to introduce themselves with this question. Can you share what led you to either WEI, UW, or GLBRC and describe uh, what you do now? All right. Um, how is the audio? All right, sounds good. Um, so my name is Whitney Liu. I'm an assistant professor here at UW-Madison in the chemical and biological engineering department. And I'd say really my, my journey to the Wisconsin Energy Institute and UW-Madison as a whole was really my passion for starting research. Um, when I was younger, you know, I was always into science and math, but this idea of going after questions that didn't have answers, I thought was very interesting and really fascinating. And to be the one that can make those discoveries and find out something that nobody else has ever learned, I think really drove my curiosity and my passion to pursue a career in academia. Um, what drove me here to UW-Madison was, you know, how great of an institution and a public institution this is. I think pub public education is extremely important, and I love how much we're able to serve the state to improve it, both from a sustainability point as well as from an education point. My research broadly focuses on polymeric materials or plastics, but we try to think about how we can use these plastics in order to promote a more sustainable future. So our research really focuses on two main areas. First is energy storage, what brought me here to the Wisconsin Energy Institute, thinking about how we can design next generation batteries, as well as thinking about plastics recycling. So how can we take our current waste that we're generating right now and think about how we can stop the accumulation of that waste by recycling what we think is trash and hopefully creating new products out of those materials. Hi everyone, my name is Aurora. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so I am a postdoc in the same department as Professor Whitney, the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering. There I work with Professor Victor Zavala and my research area is systems engineering. And a little about how I got here, well, actually it all started in a similar panel to this one. Uh, back in high school, I attended to a career panel where I saw a female professor in chemical engineering and uh, at that point, I didn't know that that could be a career path for me. And she told us everything about her research, all her daily activities. And that was amazing for me. I was like, wow, I want to do this uh, with my life. So after that, I went and studied my undergrad, master's, and PhD in chemical engineering. And particularly in my PhD, I had the opportunity to, to come to UW-Madison uh, to do a research stay for a year. And I was working with Professor uh, Victor Zavala back then. So after that, I graduated and I thought, okay, what is the next step for me? I want to stay in academia. I really want to do uh, outreach activities, teaching, research, and mentorship as well. So I came back to Madison now as a postdoc. And uh, a little about my research in general, what I do is that I use systems engineering tools to analyze complex systems. For instance, I use process modeling, uh, life cycle assessment, and techno-economic analysis to see how we can design and optimize uh, sustainable systems. So I am really interested on in integrating different uh, areas, such as economic, environmental, and social analysis. And one of the applications that I am uh, currently working on is the plastic subsidence. 
So as part of this, I collaborate in the chemical upcycling uh, for waste plastic center that we have at the department. And something very exciting there is that I, I get to collaborate with people from different areas and I get to learn a lot from them. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So my name is Anne-Sophie Boer. I'm the training coordinator here uh, for the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center. Um, I do have a background, uh, a scientific background, because I graduated with my PhD in plant biochemistry from France. And after that, I decided to come to the US to do a postdoc. And so I got a first position, really my only postdoc position, actually, at Michigan State University. And initially, my goal was to come to the US to have an experience outside of France. It was all very laid out for me. It was like three years, great, there's funding. Then I go back to France, I become a faculty, I do a lot of teaching, perfect. And then I came to the US and my PI very rapidly told me that he had no funding. And within three months, he was already talking about my fourth year. And so then I was like, well, okay, maybe I'm gonna stay a little longer. And uh, my husband and I actually decided to stay pretty much forever. Um, but with this decision came also the realization that I did not want to be a faculty. Um, and so I spent, I would say, six years figuring out what I wanted to do. And by being involved in a lot of things at Michigan State University on top of my research, mostly interacting with the postdoctoral association, I got to interact with a lot of people in administration, research administration, academic administration, mostly within the grad school and postdoctoral study field, I guess. Um, and then this is where I realized that what I really wanted to do was helping people figure out their career because I had such a great support and I found really great mentors to help me figure out what I wanted to do. And mostly I realized that being a postdoc, being a grad student is very lonely because we never really want to say out loud that we're lost and that we are afraid and that we don't know what to do. And I realized that by saying it, a lot of people were saying it back to me. And so this is where I basically decided to go into this career. And so my three-year initial postdoc became nine years, not by choice. Um, and throughout these nine years, I uh, switched my overall research team and joined the GLBRC initially as a postdoc. And really, I think what was attractive to me was the idea that the research I was going to do by myself in my lab, my very little nugget of science was actually going to be helpful and useful for a lot of people within the center. And it was a really great opportunity to collaborate with so many different people. And then even though I was developing skills for the job that I have now, I was still involved in my research. And I guess being involved in a lot of professional development kind of was seen by the right people. And eventually they told me they were creating a training coordinator position and nudge me to apply for the position. And so I stayed in the GLBRC, except now I'm on the other side of the lake at UW Medicine. And so that's where I'm at. I am not a scientist anymore, technically, but <laughs> just helping them. <laughs> oh, lovely thing to report so far. Um, my name is Becky Larson. I am a professor in the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies. Uh, I just ran here in my running shoes <laughs> because I just moved offices and it's farther away than I thought. So, sorry. <laughs> um, I also went to Michigan State. So my pathway here, um, I grew up in an urban area outside of Detroit. Um, I went to Michigan State. I was no idea what I was doing, just kind of all over the place. Um, finally, people kept telling me you should be an engineer. And I kept saying, there's no way I could be, want to be an engineer. And then they were like, no, I think that feels right. You like math, you like science, like try that. So finally my senior year of college, I gave that a whirl. So I switched to engineering and crammed it all in in a very short two years. 
Um, then I worked for a field crops entomologist during that time. And I was like, whoa, agriculture is like, I don't understand any of this. Um, so that grew my interest and I was like digging up bugs in the dirt under corn plants. So we couldn't like that. And so then I was like, let's do some more things. And so I went to grad school and I started working in shit. So I would climb into like tanks of shit literally. I remember my mom being like, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, and that was, and you know, it's hard for me not to see how everybody would love that. Um, I would collect samples at like 3 a.m. go out and like wait for rain. So I think all of that, I was like, oh, I don't know, this is a great time, right? And so then after I finished my PhD, I was like, I guess more of this shit job seems right. So I started applying for jobs in UW was my first interview and that went worked well. So kind of just like, here I am. Um, I got here, I had no clue what I was doing. Uh, I like to say when people say RFP, which is like a proposal that any new faculty member should know that abbreviation, I had no idea what that meant. I Googled a lot of things each night when I went home. <laughs> it was a stumbling few years, but um, I've made my way. Uh, I've been here now 13 years or something like that. Um, moved through the ranks. I just moved to a full professor, so I'm very happy about that. Um, I study all kinds of environmental related things, mostly to do with food systems. So uh, manure in Wisconsin is a pretty prime target for that. Um, I also study food waste or other waste, and I love to get my hands dirty in a whole lot of things that I don't know what I'm doing. And then, you know, you learn. I kind of love the process of not understanding anything and feeling like an idiot. And then, oh, at some point, someone's telling me to give a presentation, and you're like, remember two months ago? And I <laughs> pretended I didn't know anything. Um, no, still pretending. No. So it, it was an interesting pathway. I also have an extension appointment. Um, that's been a, it's like a challenging thing um, to have an extension appointment. I think you're asked to do a whole range of things um, that maybe get way outside of your comfort zone, but then you also get this lovely interaction with stakeholders and, you know, people sometimes will be like, how do you come up with all these research ideas? I'm like, I don't, you know, people just tell me things and then it kind of clicks. And so you get this really cool way of interacting. And so that's mostly what I do now. I teach a few classes, do some extension and research anything that smells bad. <laughs> So we are going to get started with our questions now. I want to remind everybody listening in that you can um, submit your questions online through the Q&A. Um, so to begin, I would like to ask each of our panelists, what is the most exciting part of what you do? Because there's so many different roles here, I'd really like to hear from all of you. What do you want to get started? I'll go first again. Um, I think the most exciting thing about what I do is as an assistant professor, um, you know, we just heard from Becky, I teach classes, I lead a research group, um, I work in service and outreach for the university, but everything that involves students really is the most exciting part. Um, I think the students are where, you know, you're supposed to be teaching them, whether it's in a classroom or a lab setting, but it's mostly happening in the other direction. The students are teaching you about things you never expected to learn. And I think that's where, you know, that's where really the magic happens and where you will learn the most and where you can kind of make the most strides, whether it's in research, whether it's in understanding how to better teach course material to really impact students. Um, whenever I get to work with the students, I know it's going to be a good day. I guess I'll go next. <laughs> so that's a... <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> so I really like uh, what Professor Whitney just mentioned. Yes, I, I don't have a lot of teaching experience so far or mentorship, but just this last year, I was uh, mentoring two undergraduate students and I really enjoyed that part as well. I think it's actually the same that I learned a lot from them and I hope they learn a little bit from me. <laughs> and also uh, I, I, something that really, really excites me is to see how my research can help to advance something in the real world. Like nowadays we have a lot of problems, of course, related to sustainability and many other aspects. And uh, currently what I'm doing with the Waste uh, Upcycling Center 
is that I help with the economic and environmental analysis. And then when I see the people in the lab doing all those very difficult experiments that I cannot do, but then I go and, and tell them, okay, you know what, if we change this, we can improve the economics and the emissions that the process is generating. And then we go and talk to the people in industry and they tell us, okay, this looks good. We can actually invest on that. Uh, this looks promising, like in 10 years, probably we will have it out there. So for me, that is the, the most exciting to see that at least we, we are trying to help you a little bit to make a, a better world. Um, I guess for me, what's exciting is that I get to be a support system for everyone. I said mostly grad students and postdocs, but even for faculty, right? Because in my job, when we talk about professional and career development, it's been very trending. It's been really at the forefront more and more over the past few years. But I think there's still a little bit, you know, like people are still a bit shy and they don't really know what to ask. And faculty can be a bit wary about it because they're like, well, they're gonna dissuade people to be in academia, which is not my goal. And so I think just the idea that I can help people and while I'll, I help them, I also learn so much stuff because I have my own path and I cannot know everything about every career, about every intention. And so having these interaction really helps me also broaden my own vision of what a career can look like. And I think everybody has their own ideas. And I'm kind of here to help them figure it out if they don't know yet. So that's what's exciting for me. Sorry. Good answers. Uh, I would say I'm a research junkie. Like I love research. Uh, there's a lot of parts of my job that I hate, if I'm honest. <laughs> but research is the thing that keeps me like chugging through the rest of it. Uh, I will say like memories in my head of like brainstorming when you've got like a cool group of people. Uh, I remember some with Victor's Avalis team and some others were, you know, we're like in a room, something's really complicated, everyone's throwing ideas, and you're on a whiteboard, and you're like, that's terrible, no, that's wonderful, and then you're like, no, backtrack, you know, like, that's super exciting to me, and I love when you get this really positive group of people with these giant brains, where you're like, these people aren't amazing, and you're like throwing all these ideas around, and then something comes out of it that you think is like, this is awesome, like, this is great, and then you're like, shit, we got to go do this now. And then you get out there and you get data. And I still, when new data comes in for my students, even if they send it to me at like midnight, I'll be like, oh, I just gotta, I mean, that might give a little away of what I'm doing with my life, but <laughs> well, you know, I'll be like, oh, and then I'll be like, no, it's time to go to bed. But I'll be like, oh, I gotta look into this the other way, you know? So I love those parts. I'll also say like, I just love the growth, you know? Like you're just, it's like all this growth, you know, you're stretching your brain. I would say international research even pushes me farther. You know, you're doing all these things, but in a context that you totally don't understand. So you've got to work with all these people who you've got to trust them and trust that, you know, learn to listen about their situation. And so that's even more exciting and more, you just get to learn so much in that context too. So that's, that's what drives me. That's definitely what keeps me going. I like that we're ending on this trust and learning note because that's going to lead into my next question. Um, and any of you can answer this if you'd like, um, or many of you. Um, <laughs> what is something that has really helped or supported you in your journey navigating STEM? I'll let people think for a moment before, <laughs> before I ask. Would you like to answer? Okay. Unless someone else, sure, go for it. This has supported me. Um, I don't know, man, that's a tough one family, friends, uh, other colleagues who you whine to like on a regular basis. I have like two people that I call when I'm like, the student is pushing me, you know? <laughs> or you're like, this project is a disaster. You know, you gotta lean on some people, you know? Um, you find mentors along the way, surprisingly. I, I don't think I was a, oh, let's set up this official mentor system, you know? But you kind of learn along the way. Like I would learn from some colleagues, like don't do it like that. But then you would see some people who you're like, whoa, look at the way they're operating. I remember watching a presentation once and being like, this is terrible. <laughs> when I left, I was like, oh, that, didn't, oh, that was like, what a waste. And a colleague of mine said, 
hey, they're doing their best. What, like giving me a little push against like, don't be such an angle, right? And I was like, I would rather be like that, right? I wanna find my way to be positive. And so you find these mentors and things along the way of people who teach you little things or, you know, if you can just take a minute to identify people you wanna be like, you know, it helps navigate. And maybe you don't wanna be exactly like them, but you know, you pick a trait. Like I like the way that person talks to students or I like the way that person handles running and eating. And so I think you can find those people, even if they're not kind of informal things. And then, you know, people to whine to when you're hitting some lows and <laughs> need a little support. Yeah, I can, I can add a little bit onto that. So um, like Becky has alluded to, there's many, many parts of the job of being a professor. Um, and a lot of them are really great. And a lot of them are, are not so great. Um, but I'm really lucky that I have a, a group of friends who are going through this journey with me at various locations, various universities, people who I've met at conferences and just through my research in general in that community. And so having those people um, to complain to, to ask, you know, the silliest, dumbest questions that maybe you might be afraid to ask, you know, your colleague who expects you to know the answers and be an adult by this point is extremely helpful um, and really feel like you have that trust with someone and they're not going to say, oh, well, you should, you should know that um, because they're going through that, that journey with you has been really, really great. I'd also say, and I'm sure we can you know, attest to this, that our department is extremely supportive. We have a very, I think it's a, not a formal, but an informal rule that no question is too dumb. Um, so instead of me sitting and Googling where is the largest recycling bin in engineering hall to get rid of all the boxes in my office? I'll, I can just ask someone and they won't think that that's a waste of their time. They're always willing to help us um, because starting this new job, like Becky you know, alluded to, is very complicated. There's so many moving pieces and it's unlike anything you've done before. Um, so it's really great to have people who aren't going to judge you or think less of you for asking those questions. Open it to anybody else. Would you like to? Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Yes. So yes, I completely agree with you. <laughs> yes, we have a very nice environment in the department. Like everyone is is always there, willing to help, and that is amazing. And also uh, following up in what uh, Sir Becky was saying, yes, I think mentors are really really important. I have been very lucky to have very good mentors through all my career since high school, undergrad, like in all the stages, I, I have had a lot of many, many good mentors, but also I know friends that ha haven't been very lucky and they have had some bad experiences. So I think it's important to uh, have a mentor, but then if you don't have like uh, a good relationship going on there, probably just then just go and look for another mentor or just another person that uh, can help you because uh, we were, I think, discussing this back in the podcast with Michelle, that uh, people always want to help and we just need to ask and they will be like, oh, yes, sure. Like you're mentioning, uh, soon I will be applying for faculty positions. And I know it's going to be super stressful, but I have received a lot of uh, support from the department, like different uh, new professors, like Professor Whitney. They are always telling me like, oh, whenever you, you need to uh, write your package, just let me know, I can give it a, a quick look or I can give you some advice. So I think that's, that is okay to always ask uh, questions and, and uh, just help other people as well. I just want to add that, yes, ask questions, worst case to say no, at least you know, right? Um, and it's not the end of the world. And I think really regarding mentorship, especially because I don't have a linear scientific career, it's valid for everyone to know that your advisor, your PI is not by default your mentor. They are your advisor, they can be your mentor, but not one person can bring all the things that you need to grow professionally or even personally. And I think it's something that can be stressful and can be very scary when you're a grad student feeling like, oh, but I cannot ask another professor something that my PI is not going to provide for me. And I think it's really what my own path taught me navigating STEM and that environment. Considering the career I wanted to do, no PI could help me, 
right? Like no one had ever done that. And so I, I had to find the mentors, but I also had to find the opportunities. And then after getting a lot of experiences and a lot of like credentials for my CV, the biggest lesson was then for me to learn to say no and not say no just because I don't want to do it, but also say no because I realized that every opportunity is not worth it if I don't actually gain something from it, whether it's a skill or a network or whatever it is. And so I think this was also one of the biggest lessons for me to just be able to be like, mm, actually, I don't have the time. It won't be that, it won't bring me that much more, I don't know, skills or whatever. So saying no is also, I think, very important, um, especially I feel like as a woman in STEM where we tend to be very much like people pleasing. So just say no if you don't want, so. Thank you all for sharing. Um, <clears throat> another thing that we have talked about in these interviews um, that's come up a lot and is especially prevalent that we found with uh, women in STEM is something called the imposter phenomenon where we feel like, Maybe our achievements um, are uh, not actually, we're, we're not worth our achievements, basically. Um, so I think this has come up in almost like every interview in some capacity. What advice do you have to overcome this feeling or, or better understand it? I think the first thing is to understand that everybody has it and it might be more prevalent in women, but everyone goes through that at some point. It's just the twisted mindset sometimes that you should not appear weak because saying you don't know, right? All of a sudden it's like, I think I'm supposed to know that, but I don't. So I'm just not going to say that I don't know. And frantically search for the information, right? When really it's like, no, you don't know what you don't know, but at least you're honest about it. And you just say, I don't know, but I can look into it. And I think this is really, it's really hard to do it, right? Because you also have to admit to yourself that you don't know, um, but also voicing it because I think there's this fear of being judged. And it's not because you don't know that you're less valuable because you absolutely know something that someone else doesn't know. They just never tell you that they don't know it, right? And so I think that's just reminding yourself that everybody at some point is like an imposter and it's don't dive into that dark hole, right? Like don't focus on the things you don't know. Just ask for help. Yeah, I would, I would say that's, that's good advice. You know, a lot of people say, I found the more you say, start saying I don't know, more other people say they don't know, and you all learn more, so that's good. Uh, everybody kind of feels like they don't sometimes belong or know enough. Comparisons aren't a great thing, so if you could start not doing that, <laughs> that'd be good. Particularly comparing yourself to someone who's 20 years into their career. Like, that's not... That's not a wise idea, right? They, I am much different than I was 13 years ago, right? Like I've changed a lot. And a lot of that changes because I screwed shit up a lot, right? Like I made a lot of mistakes and had to learn from them. Um, I also like, you know, I like to tell people, you, you're going to make mistakes anyway. You're going to feel bad. You know, you're going to sometimes not be so confident in yourself. The thing is, if you make the choice to do something and you fail, so be it. That was your choice. You let other people influence your choices and then you fail. That feels like shit, right? I took that person's advice. I didn't even do what I wanted and it didn't work, right? So do what you want to do. I also heard someone recently say something that I really like about imposter syndrome that it's not imposter syndrome. It's this social structure that is being impressed upon you to be something, to be that this is what you are and whatever, you know? So the, the more you can start to throw that away and just remind yourself, this is what I want. This is what I want to do. I'm a badass, you know? Like I can do whatever I want. I can, you know, 
go fishing in my underwear. I can like solve this problem. You know, I can, I can do what's me and then that's okay. Just to add, especially when research, academic research is based on your innovation, right? You get money when you're innovative and you stand out. So if you try to fit the mold that academia has basically put together over the past, I don't know, a few centuries, you're less likely to be recognized because you will not be standing out as your own thing. So, yeah. Cool. I think you should go first. Okay. Okay. Are you sure? <laughs> yeah, I think that, you know, imposter syndrome is definitely something that I have dealt with and I will deal with for my life. So I don't think it's something you should ever try to overcome because those feelings are always going to manifest themselves in some way. You know, saying I'm going to become the most confident and self-assured person. If I blink my eyes three times and you know stop comparing myself to others, you know, it doesn't work like that. You know, it's thinking about where these feelings are coming from and why, you know, why do you think where's where's that lack of self-worth coming from? You know, I think for me, I growing up, I never thought I could be an academic or a scientist because I have very poor attention to detail. And, you know, you see these scientists in movies and TVs, they double check their answers. They, you know, they're the students that will sit until, you know, the buzzer rings on an exam and check every answer twice, make sure every T is crossed. And that was just something I could never do. Um, and so I was prescribing this trait that is not relevant at all to being a scientist or being an academic. Um, but that's what I thought I needed to be. And because I didn't have that, I was never going to succeed. You know, none of that is real, but those feelings still exist. And so you're not, you know, trying to overcome those feelings. It's not an easy task. And so that's never a task I would ask someone to do. But thinking about, you know, where are these standards coming from? And is it some social norm that maybe, maybe isn't real? Maybe I shouldn't obey. Or is this coming from a place inside yourself? And then maybe that you should take a look at and think about, you know, why, is, why do you not think that you can do it? Is that real? Or is that just, you know, you being your own worst enemy? That's great. Thank you. So intentionally, I wanted to go at the end <laughs> because I know all of you have more experience than me. And this is something that, just like you say, I think everyone experienced at some point in our lives. And yeah, some days also I experienced it. Mainly, I would say in this stage of my career where I'm like, okay, what am I going to do next? Am I going to be enough for the next step? What happens if I don't become a professor? Will the world end? No, it won't. <laughs> right? But, but yeah, you, you think about that every every time. Well, not every day, but sometimes. Yeah. But I think it's it's really important to first acknowledge that you are feeling like that and think what I can do to stop feeling like that just focus of course on the positive things or all your achievements and things like that but I think it's also really important as you were mentioning just don't follow the rules or all the uh, stories that we have heard in our life like oh probably becoming an engineer that is only for me Right, uh, women. Oh no, they, they like other career paths. But no, I think that at this point uh, of history where we are right now, everyone can do whatever they want. Like it doesn't matter if you are a woman, if you are a man, uh, if you come from one country or from the other. Uh, so I think we, we need to focus on that and <coughs> only stop thinking. Oh, I should do this because this is what my family used to do before, my grandmother and, and so on and just try to, to follow your dreams and acknowledge that uh, you can be enough if you want to be enough. Thank you all for sharing. <clears throat> um, I, I really like what you said, kind of shifting how you think about imposter syndrome and really taking it away from how you think of yourself and how it's really like what other people are putting on to you. Um, and this is a little bit of a plug for one of our episodes from the first season. We, we talk about that a lot because like in the word imposter syndrome, imposter puts the, like the fault on the person that's feeling it when 
all of those feelings are, are really coming from external sources. Um, so if in case you don't know what episode I'm talking about, it's uh, Steffi Dion's episode, the first episode of season one. We talk about um, basically like how the, the whole word is, uh, re reflects the, the feeling, like how it originates and everything. Um, <laughs> so check that out. Um, I'm going to shift to another question. This one um, kind of talks to more of like the systemic support that you might have experienced or that you see changing. Um, what are some of those changes that you've seen that have made STEM more equitable, equitable for women or for everyone? So as I was mentioning before, uh, my first experience at the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering was back uh, during my PhD in 2018. So one difference from uh, back then and now is that I see more female professors in the department. So I think that is awesome. <laughs> Whitney is one example of that. And I think this is an effort uh, currently being done around the, the country because I've been to different conferences and I keep seeing in every department, they are hiring a more diverse a set of, of professors. And I think that that is amazing. So uh, I think that is one change that I have seen recently and hopefully it will continue like that. This is a tough one because I have to say, I find the systemic problems to be the things still limiting us. And even at this institution, there's a lot of problems and they don't get addressed very often. And I um, am definitely an outspoken person about the issues that we face as, um, as faculty who are in some cases underrepresented in certain areas. Um, I will say it is, that is one good, I think you mentioned one good thing about seeing more, more female faculty. I've seen a lot of pressure to try to improve that dynamic in many departments where it wasn't very good. Um, I run a women in science and engineering program, right? So I feel like there's a lot of us doing a lot of things to try to change maybe some of the things that we felt were against us as we came through. I know there's lots of women before me that feel they did the same thing. Um, and, you know, we make little inches along the way. So I think there's more awareness. Uh, maybe the system hasn't reflected that awareness very well, but I find I have more colleagues who are at least aware or can at least provide support, even if they can't be, or they don't wanna be an outspoken supporter. Um, I find that you can find people in administration or higher up positions that can be supported. I think maybe there was a point when that didn't exist. Um, I also try to remind myself that I'm lucky, that I can say what I want and I still have a job and I still get paid and I can still do what I want. Um, so I will say there is some progress there. Uh, still a bit to go though. Yeah, I would say, I think, you know, personally one of the biggest systemic changes is that we talk about it we acknowledge that this inequity exists and this gender gap or, you know, there are underrepresented groups in STEM and there's education about that. Um, you know, there's a lot of great trainings that are quite effective of talking about things like unconscious bias and microaggressions and whether or not, you know, like Becky alluded to, you know, people want to step up and make large scale systemic changes I think the fact that the community is starting to acknowledge them is really the first step. You know, there has been, you know, wide scale and maybe progress is not the right word, but, you know, instances of seeing more representation in media and popular culture about, you know, promoting these types or improving these types of inequities, we should say. And I think that is, you know, kind of the biggest thing that has led to some of this change is just having and being able to talk about it and not getting called a victim or being blamed, but, you know, the numbers don't lie. And so this shouldn't be something that we try to brush underneath the rug. 
it takes a lot of work and it will take more work to really fix these issues, but at least we can have open dialogue about them. Okay. Um, I am now, <clears throat> I am now going to open it up to our Q and A, um, either online if you have any questions, um, submit them in the Q and A and we'll ask our panelists or anybody here can ask a question. Yes, okay. I'll give this to you. <laughs> um, thank you for the inspiring session. I'm Zian. I'm a PhD student in environmental engineering. Um, I'm just wondering, like, because I attend like lots of this kind of session talking about like gender and um, women, but I feel like in the audience normally it's just women or like females. So I'm wondering, like, how can I expand this kind of discussion to not just within our community but also raise the attention from like male and thank you for being here because <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like this kind of discussion is really inspiring at least for me and I also want to expand like this kind of impacts to like you know other genders so I'm just wondering like whether you have any suggestions or like um, any insights in terms of how can we expand those kind of impacts to the broader communities I agree. I noticed the same thing, right? It's a panel of women and there's one male in the audience. Um, I think there's a very big burnout when it comes to DEI talk. And it's mostly, in my opinion, it's mostly because it's everywhere, but it's not really going anywhere. And I think it's because there's so much to learn. No one is an expert at it. But it also comes from perspectives that are very different. If you, you know, like if we were all chiming in on one single topic, we would all have different opinions. And I think the problem is, especially in academia, is that the way I see it is that the voice that matters the most is the voice of faculty, but they are spread thin. They are already under so much pressure and there's already so much things that they have to do when you ask them on top of it to basically solve the diversity problem of the world. Don't really have the capacity to do that, right? I think it's, needs all this work needs to be way more maybe downsized and more focused and more goal oriented than just be a big conversation because there's so many things to talk about there's so many things to fix that when you list them all all of a sudden you're like so we're never going to do that so instead of maybe having the big picture maybe just focusing on one thing would be more like smarter in a way to do right because we cannot tackle everything at once um, I would say the best is to try to bring these conversations at lab meetings right because if you have male colleagues they are not here today maybe it would be worth I don't know having a DEI talk for five minutes ten minutes at the beginning of every lab meeting you can attend right I think it's those little things that not just saying we do this to check a box, but we do this because it really matters. And the fact that people are bothered and burned out is because they don't understand why it matters. And they also think, in my opinion, that it's their job to fix it, when really it's not. It's just that at least let's have the conversation so there's more awareness. So when there's more awareness and more enthusiasm for that, then leadership can actually do something about it, mostly hiring people that know what they're doing. It's their job and they have strategies in place and they know what to look for and they know what problems to address and how to actually fix them. But I do think it's just a matter of bringing it up. I don't know, like let's go for coffee and let's talk about this for five minutes. It's nothing, but that's how we start, right? So I have a little bit different take 
on this. I've served on a lot of DEI committees. I've started a lot of DEI committees. And I, in a lot of the committees, we get really specific about things, right? We start tackling, like, I was charting out the salaries. I was looking at, this is how we need to change hiring practices, like critical things that need to change for the systemic changes that need to happen. Um, I think a lot of people in those circumstances also talked about that the people who are going to show up to these things are already showing up, right? That's And, and then saying that the power does not lie in those who are underrepresented, right? So how do we make those changes? So those points people have made and I think are really important. What it comes down to to me after I have worked through the system for this long is in the end, when you come up with plans and ways to change the system, there are only so many people at the top that can do that. And there, and if they say no, or they do not want to take the initiative to do that, it will not happen. And so the people with power are the ones that need the pressure and they need to make the changes. The discussions, the openness, all of that we can do, but the systemic changes are the part that are going to change the way um, the opportunities come to you. You're, you're, in my all honesty, I have never, my job isn't to go out there and convince everybody that equity and you know, right. That, that to me, hopefully will come with societal changes, but that's a really hard thing to do. Systemic changes to make equity in terms of the things where you, our opportunities, our um, ability to do the things we want to do. That is where we can make some difference quickly and easily. And I think that time and time again, there are people with the power who choose not to do that. And so that's why we continue to kind of feel like we're going around and having these discussions and they're not working. So that's my feeling. Um, I hope someone higher up listens to this and changes their mind about the next thing that comes across their desk that someone's recommending. Um, but you know, you keep pushing. Uh, do we have any other audience questions? Yeah, totally. <laughs> okay, well. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How, how do we um, push people in the power to, you know, focus on this kind of issue? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, I think the challenging part of that is like, there's probably very little people that know what people are trying to push and some of the other things. So I do agree that these conversations need to be a little more open, right? I will work on some things. And I started thinking like, why am I not sending this document to my entire college? But then I started thinking, is someone gonna get more mad than they're already mad at me, right? And then I'm like, why do I care if they're mad at me, right? So I'm like, you know, you're going through these things in your head of how to do this. So I think, you know, coordinated efforts showing up to like these real or the real initiatives are being pushed, trying to focus energy on not, you know, the discussions and things are big, but trying to find points that we need to push at, collectively deciding what's important um, and how to get enough backing behind that to push the people who are making the decisions. Um, they're going to get a lot of pushback from another group other groups of people, right? So you have to have enough emphasis. And so that you're right, that there's a lot of challenge there. I think even getting to the point where we find something we want to push about is a lot of work. And it, and it, it for me, was brutal. Like the process of getting there um, takes a lot personally to go through those kind of uh, efforts to get there. So um, yeah, I, th I think that's a good question. Um, I think maybe trying to spread more information about what we're talking about. Um, and then I get these nerves of like, as I do that, it's a very delicate dance as to the person above me, I'm gonna incentivize them or if I'm just gonna piss them off even farther and they're gonna dig, dig their heels in more. So I think, I'm sure there's people with the smarts to have strategy. And when I started to talk about these things with other people, strategies and thoughts, like there's a lot of people doing that. So I think if you can join some of the activities where really people are trying to make some differences, you can start to hear about those kind of initiatives in the way other people are thinking and moving in this space. And there are some really smart people doing some really great things that I think you can kind of find there. And I'm sure others have 
all that tall stuff. Yeah, so I, you know, going back to your first question and thinking about, you know, why is it, why is it only women in this room right now? It's definitely not our jobs to fix this problem, right? We're not the ones with power. Um, what I think is really important to show those who do have power is the things that they've already started doing that they're working. If they've already put money and time and effort into having, you know, some sort of DEI efforts or some sort of training that they give at a college or university wide level, encouraging your friends to go, whether regardless of, you know, if they're in the majority or the minority, and showing how effective, you know, point zero is or step zero is will incentivize them to do step one. But if they say, well, we've already thrown all this money and time, we have all these centers and all these diversity trainings and nobody's going and nobody has says that these are working, they're not gonna do step one, two, three, and four to get us that systemic change. And so if all we can do is get more bodies in the room at these events and have, you know, talk about how we can make them more effective, you know, we're not asking people to go sit in a two hour long training that's not gonna be helpful, but let's discuss, let's figure out programs that already exist because they are ones, you know, like Becky said, that are on campus. Um, we have to start there because they're not going to take the risks to push any buttons or make any large changes if the small changes haven't been proven effective. I just want to add to that that often, and it can be about DEI and in my career about professional development, right? People complain until it's about them. Right, that they're gonna. So when it comes to DEI, things are gonna become a problem to them once it actually directly impacts them. When really it's been impacting others for generations, right? So I completely agree with the idea that there's so many great trainings offered at UW that no one attends. So maybe if you do attend it you could do a quick paragraph summary and send it to your PI and send it to your department. And even though you might think, but I have no leverage, well, at least you send the email and maybe one person is actually gonna read it and think I have more power than her. So I will amplify what she said and I will take the workshop and oh, it is valuable and I'm gonna, and it's this snowball effect, right? I think it's also so often when people say, I have no power, so I'm just not gonna do anything without realizing that you can still impact and influence people who have more power and then they do the same and it just amplifies whatever you have to say, you know, how many, 10, 100 fold. Thank you. Yes, and I completely agree with you. I think that is important that everything counts, right? Like all of you being here today counts. So I think every little effort can get us to something bigger. Like I was commenting before, I've seen some changes. I see more uh, than years professors out there. So I think eventually things are going to change and we need to try to stay positive and try also to continue contributing in our little ways, as you were mentioning, just sharing ideas, sharing information, discourse, telling a friend, oh, let's attend to this. Oh, have you checked this article about the AI and things like that? So yeah, I think we, we need to keep pushing and be patient. <laughs> yeah, I just wanna you know, emphasize, you know, we're not, I'm not saying that, you know, if everyone takes a microaggressions training, the world's going to be saved and we're going to have, we're going to have equity. Um, but like Anne Sophie brought up earlier, the burnout is very real. Um, and we need to continue to remind, you know, those that have power that these things are important and are worthwhile. Um, because I think we're hitting an inflection point where there is some serious burnout about pushing a lot of these efforts forward. Um, cause people see time that has been in their view wasted and has not given the results that we want. So we need to keep reminding them that these issues are not solved and they're still important and valid. And you know, one of the way to do that is dragging your friends to go 
sit in a seminar that, you know, maybe we'll have some free lunch, but maybe we'll make them think about things that they haven't thought about and think about how other people have been affected that are not them. The other thing that I have learned, especially since, you know, the pandemic and basically everything that happened, all the racial issues, it's not the minority's job to teach us. And if you want to learn about systemic racism, don't go ask a Black person. Just look for it online. Try to understand, try to educate yourself. And if you have questions, then find someone who you consider is a racial minority and have a conversation, right? Don't ask people to give you a lecture just because you want to know about it. So first, look for the information yourself. And Whitney just said it, right? It's like, we make these efforts, but we don't see the results, so it's not worth it. It's kind of academic research, right? A lot of money and a lot of time gets involved and not everything works, but we keep going. We don't stop and be like, you know what? Never mind. No, we keep going. So I think it's also reminding people that that's the mentality for everything. You cannot just pick and choose what you want to be persistent about. One thing I wanted to add is, I, I'm sure you can see my cynicism and my anger coming on some of these topics, but I don't want that to be the message because the one thing that as I went through my journey and I was pissed and I, I kind of felt like I was going to ruin my career for a while, I wanted to walk away from science. I think the thing that brought me back was not that I'm like, we can fix everything because at this point, I think we can make progress, but I'm going to have to accept it might not be at the pace I want. What I can say is that I love science and what I love seeing is that I see young people, young women who are only caring about their science. And I think that's all, like that is the goal, right? The goal is that I see some younger faculty coming in here, don't give a shit about DEI stuff and they're just doing what they wanna do and people aren't getting in their way as much, you know? So I think that's like the, the beauty and I don't want us to lose that. Like I want us to remember the whole reason I'm fighting for this is because I love doing this shit and I don't want all of these burdens to be in the way for people to just do their stem look, you know? That's what I want, that's what I want. I don't want somebody having to spend as much time as I did fighting about things or the, the person before me, right? I would love if we got to a point where your job was just doing your science. So in that, I would like to ask a question and ask <laughs> these lovely panelists, if you, if you can remember like your favorite or like a moment in science that you just loved, like you were having the day and this data came in or this thing you saw in a microscope or this thing happened in class or just like some moment that was lovely. For me in science was when I did my inference, the PhD is three years. And basically when I joined my lab for my PhD, they were like, yeah, we've done this. Like we are studying the 10th isoform of that protein. We do the biochemistry, done it nine times, six month tops, two and a half years later. It was like, okay, we're kind of done with it. And I think what really was the high point was, you know, after months and six months straight of trying to purify this protein, when we finally had a tube of it, and I was like, we can actually work now. <laughs> and so, yeah, it was like an almost teary, right, moment, because everybody was like, we learned so much. And I was like, okay, cool, let's, let's work now, because it's been a while. So, yeah, that was the... <laughs> well, first, very nice question. <laughs> Thank you. And yeah, back again in 2018, when I was here doing my research stay, I was solving a complicated optimization problem, but I couldn't find the solution. So that was the problem. So I was there like every day, thinking of in the night, in the morning, how I'm going to solve it. I don't know the time is going to fly and to go back to Mexico, where, where I was studying my PhD. I don't know what I'm going to do. And then one day, I just thought, OK, I think I need to change this constraint. And this and this is going to work. And it worked. <laughs> so yeah, that was amazing. I was really, really happy. <laughs> I think for me, it was during during my PhD and I was doing a very complicated um, organic synthesis of a material. Um, and the type of synthesis I was doing, we were lucky because we were using 
um, the talent compounds for the initiator and they're, they're colorful. They make pretty colors. And so I got, I did a very complicated hard step and I knew that in, in the next 45 minutes, I went from clear to purple to teal, it would work. And I sat there and I just stared at this reactor for hours. It didn't turn color and I was devastated. Um, so I came back the next day and worked up the reaction and, and ran all my characterization and it had worked. And to this day, you know, we don't know why that specific molecule didn't turn the colors that we thought it was going to, um, but it still worked. And I've never been, was never so excited in my life. <laughs> nice. Do you have one, Becky? Can I turn it back to you? Oh, yeah, so many. I've, I've, you know, what weirdly is, if you talk to me sometimes, I'm like, what's the least favorite part of your job? And I, students kind of push on me sometimes <laughs> in ways that I get, I get frustrated. But um, I have to say, it surprises me that this came to my mind when you asked that. Like, I was in Uganda with a team from the U.S. and a team of students from Uganda. And we were in this remote place. And you know what? You know those days where everything's just going wrong and it's hot and everybody's miserable. And we were trying to run a generator off of a digester, uh, like a really small scale system. And then they wanted to hook up these lights and, I, you know, it was just, <laughs> things weren't going well, but literally the light came up, right? Like, so everything went through, the light came on and everybody was so happy, like high-fiving this whole team, just like, and it just felt really good to like, see these people have this vision for what they wanted to do, put in all of this hard work, and then just have this moment of like, the joy, the joy, you know, just like, we did it. I mean, later we ended up taking those lights down and switching to a different end product, like a biogas killer or something. But the joy of those, of all those, that team that put so much effort, that, that really is stuck in my mind as a lovely day. Yeah, thank you all for sharing those moments. Uh, we are at our like last couple of minutes. Oh, we have one more. I have one question. Oh, oh yeah, one. sure. Um, I'm curious that I think that there might be some people who think that the reason that there aren't more women in STEM or and as faculty members might be because they've opted out due to work-life balance, right? Like that for their families, that that's the choice that they maybe need to make, as opposed to thinking that there might be more systemic things that are keeping women from um, these positions. And I was just interested in your perspective on that. I mean, I, would, I think it's a, you know, my personal view is that it, it is a systemic thing that, you know, these gender norms exist, that women might want to have more work-life balance than, um, than male faculty members do. And so I see those two things as being extremely interconnected, um, is that being, you know, things like tenure extensions for maternity leave and those types of aspects. And they're all, they're all connected, but those are all connected to society's norms of what a man and a woman does and how these gender roles have played out. I really think it's clear to me after looking at a ton of data and looking at the, you know, I'm, I'm just raped through data about this, that the performance standards for a lot of are not equal amongst everybody. So to be considered equal, you're taking on more workload. And then if you're also taking on more workload at home, that that's a disaster in the making, right? And so the, the people that make it through that are just like feeling the burden. I hear people saying things like, I'm, I'm doing a terrible job at home and I'm doing a terrible job at work. And the, you know, like I feel like shit, right? Like what the heck? So, I think there's these systemic things that all, that could improve the work part of it, right? The, the, the other part and the balance, that is under your control already, right? Like you can try to make that work, but the work part, if your workload has to meet a certain standard or you're being asked to do things or they're taking your lab away or you have less lab space or they're not giving you the resources that they're giving other people. I mean, these are all systemic things that, that happen on a regular basis. I mean, I have so many examples in models. I think it boggles people of mind when they start to actually hear the data. And I mean, I can serve you up the data, right? 
Um, so these things are the things that need to change. Now, after that, could the balance still be tough? Yeah, the balance for everybody is tough. But these things have to be addressed to make to make it even possible. You know, it's like you're, you're just putting the constraints on. And then when in some circumstances, now I think there's areas where they've come strides in the in the civility and the, the atmosphere that you might have. But I do think there are still places where that attitude also comes down at you too, right? So you're fending things in so many directions that I think the systemic things are the easiest first chunk. Like we need to do that first. Like you said earlier, it might not be all we need to do, but I think that would take a lot of the burden away and make it so people could um, really find some balance a little bit easier. And uh, I know that people don't know that all these things impact them or happen, but it, it does. You know, if you see the amount of money, like, you know, okay, we're inching up on winning grants, but major big grants, no, right? That still is dominated by men. And, and it's not always about submission rates and other things. Like it's very clear, the data is very clear, right? Uh, even our own universities dole out money, get raises, money. Your salary is really important to the way you can support your life. So if you don't make enough salary, well, then now I got to go. I can't send my kid to the fancy daycare. So now I got to give a shit more about what's that, right? So there's all these balances that happen because these systemic things didn't get taken care of. And so if we can eliminate those, I really am passionate about that, that then, you know, at least it makes the playing field closer to level that we can navigate through. Just to add is that that's the thing of living in a system that is not evolved with its time. When a woman decides to have kids, all of a sudden, you know, it's like, oh, she prioritizes her personal life. It's like, no, it's just that I want to have kids. I have kids. My husband, my partner also has kids, but we never talk about the men having kids, right? There's also, I think the language is also very hurtful because uh, a new father who takes paternity leave is like, oh my God, such a good dad. He's taking six weeks to take care of his kids. But if a mom takes three months of maternity leave after actually giving birth, no one is going to say anything about it, right? Because it's the norm. It's just like, it's expected. But then if a mom goes to a conference, often they get asked, who takes care of your kids? They're never going to ask this to a man, right? A woman become, is just a mom. A man is the best father. So I think it's also checking ourselves of how we talk about these things, right? And stop assuming that it's just, it's only our role as women. And also because it's considered just being a mom or only doing that, it's like, no, yeah, this is what shows that we are way better because those are norms that have been put on women forever. And despite the evolution of work-life balance and despite women wanting careers, they're still managing both when really the system was never designed for a woman to work at least 40 hours a week and be a mother and be a caregiver. And so I think it's also like sometimes just recognizing that we do it despite the system. And so if we could also, yeah, sway a little more towards benefiting women and mothers, it would be way easier. Yeah, so from uh, my personal experience, I think I can add that it's important also for the new generations to just uh, do whatever they want. And uh, for me, it was important to fight uh, to against what society expected from me, from uh, what my culture expected from me. And I think, of course, it's, it's not always easy to do this, but it's important to find the appropriate support. I'm very lucky to have a very supportive family. Also, my partner is very supportive. So I, I think that that is uh, something key. Just try to go and follow our dreams and don't think about, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. This is what other people think. Um, 
things like that. Okay, thank you all for the excellent questions and the great discussion. Um, I think we are at time, so I'm gonna have to end it there. Thank you so much to our panelists and to everyone in the audience for coming. Um, like I said at the beginning, we are releasing our first episode tomorrow. So watch out for that. There's a QR code up on the screen where you can subscribe to the podcast. Our first episode will actually feature and Sophie. So um, be prepared. She'll be, her face will be blasted in all of your, your Twitter feeds, <laughs> emails, everything. Uh, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And thank you. I say that huge thank you for all the wisdom that you all just shared. Really appreciate your time and really appreciate Michelle and Mike for moderating today. Um, I wanted to plug another event that the Wisconsin Energy Institute is participating in, uh, not this Saturday, but a week from Saturday on May 6th. The Wisconsin Energy Institute is one of four locations participating in UW Family Garden Day. And this is a great chance for folks to come to campus, tour some gardens and greenhouses, get a tour of the Energy Institute, see our labs, meet scientists and take home some free plants for a garden or to grow inside your home. So I hope that you can share the word with folks who you think may be interested. And thank you again. Have a good night, everybody.